This is Anton Watson, and you're listening to the Take 22 podcast, presented by the Spokesman Review. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, episode of the Take 22 podcast with Anton Watson, presented by the Spokesman Review. I'm Theo Lawson, a Gonzaga Beat reporter for the Spokesman Review. I'm here with... Anton Watson. Anton, how's it going? It's going good. You know, a little, little light day. Nothing too much today, but just chilling right now. What does a light day look like for uh, Anton Watson in the middle of a basketball season? Uh, just a couple classes, some weights, and... And practice usually, and that's basically my light day. <laughs> Sounds good. This is our first episode. This is going to be a weekly episode taped on Monday. We're coming to you Monday night. We're taping this Monday night from the uh, Spokesman Review Tower, the fourth floor. So expect this to to come to your your doorstep, your uh, um, all your podcast avenues on Tuesday morning. You can uh, find us at iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we're going to just uh, kind of be recapping some games previewing the next week of games, and um, hopefully have some of Anton's teammates and some other guests on, right? Yes, sir. Um, we're going to uh, kind of get to know Anton today in the first episode, talk about last week's games against Santa Clara and St. Mary's, preview this week's games against um, USF and BYU. We're also going to just do a little recap of of the season. Uh, we're we're kind of coming to you guys late in the season, but it's all about uh, peaking for March, right? Yeah. You guys know all about that, right? Most definitely. Then at the end of the podcast, we're going to have a little segment called Catch and Shoot, where we ask Anton some quick hitter questions. Make sure to stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Take 22 podcast with Anton Watson. Uh, quickly, we'll go over uh, Gonzaga's games last week. We're going to start out with an 88-70 win over Santa Clara in Spokane. Um, the Zags uh, beat Santa Clara. Santa Clara played you guys really close down there. Uh, kind of needed a, a late three-pointer from uh, Nolan Hickman to, to kind of rescue you guys and, and come out with the win down there. But I think uh, you guys really started to kind of turn the quarter defensively in that game. Um, only gave up 24 points in the first half to the Broncos, who have a really good offensive team led by Brandon Pajemski. And uh, I, I believe that was your lowest uh, point total conceded in a half since the, uh, the season opener against North Florida. Uh, just talk a little bit about your guys' defense and, and kind of how you feel about that side of the ball right now. Yeah, so we, we've been focused on defense for the past couple months, you know. <laughs> and I think that was just one of our, our main focals. And um, first half, we came out with some energy. Uh, and you could just tell by everyone on the court. And the bench was bringing energy, the fans. and. It just kind of felt like a different vibe that game, but um, we definitely brought it first half, and then uh, that kind of carried the momentum for us going into the second, and we kind of kept that lead. Um, they they got a couple of tough buckets in the second half, and you know they were scoring a lot more, but that first half kind of kind of helped a lot by slowing them down and slowing their slowing their flow. What do you think is making the difference on the defensive side? You know, Coach Few has talked about rotations, closing out on three-point shooters, uh, just just kind of doing assignments. Is it kind of that simple on the defensive side of things for you guys right now? And where do you see the most improvement if, if you had to pick one or two things? Yeah, I would just say everyone buying into the defense is the biggest thing. Um, just picking up for a man when he gets back cut or something or uh, diving on the floor for a ball, just all the little things. Um, I think one one area we clean up just as a team, bigs and guards, is just defensive rebounding, um, not giving them second chance points. But overall, I think our defense is collectively getting better. And, you know, we're gelling a lot better together on the defensive end. We're going to talk about your stat line from that game real quick. Eight of eight from the field, didn't miss a shot from the field. Tied your season high with 18 points. I believe your career high is 23, so it didn't quite get there, but we got, we got some time the rest <laughs> of the year. Uh, five uh, five rebounds, four assists, no turnovers. Um, you're actually uh, averaging 63% from the field on shots in conference games. That's uh, leading the WCC. Do you want to take a guess on who's uh, number two on that list right now? Probably Drew. Drew Timmy, <laughs> <Yeah>. 54%. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're the only uh, player in the conference uh, making more than 60% of your shots. And I think you talked about this after the game on Thursday. And I know a lot of uh, attention goes to Drew in these games. But what else are you kind of doing within your own game to, to be more efficient this year? 
Uh, I think just being aggressive. Um, I put in so much work over the summer, and even the days before the games, I can go in and get extra shots. So um, all that work is just giving me the confidence to go in the game and uh, shoot the shots that I can shoot and get to my spots, get to the hook, or even knock down some threes. So um, I think my confidence on the offensive side is just – it just keeps getting higher, and um, I think that's just helped me a lot in the long run. We're going to flip the page to uh, Saturday's game against St. Mary's. 78-70 uh, to 70 overtime loss to the Gales down in Moraga. Uh, moved you guys to 19-5 and five and 8-2 and and in conference play. Um, I, th I felt like you guys really set the tone coming out of the gates in that game. That's a hard thing to do against St. Mary's because they play such a, such a slow pace. You talked about it after Thursday. It's kind of like, like watching a pickup game, right? It's kind of the old man game, and I think that's a, a compliment to St. Mary's is what you meant. But um, uh, you, you guys came out, and I, I didn't really feel like you guys had many issues on offense and really kind of dictated what was happening in that game. Can you kind of take me through the first half of that game and how you guys felt uh, going into halftime? Yeah, we knew it was going to be physical and just a just high energy game. Um, we came out we came out fighting and we got a lot of defensive stops, which definitely helped. Kind of like the Santa Clara game, uh, that kind of gave us the control of the game for a little bit. And the offense was flowing. We were getting good possessions on the offense and no turnovers. So, yeah, the start to that game was I think it was one of one of our best all year. I want to ask you about one uh, sequence in that game. Uh, you get blocked on one end of the floor. Uh, Logan Johnson gets stuffed by Hunter Salas. He chases him down. One of one of the better blocks uh, I've seen covering this team, uh, chase down blocks at least, and, and uh, you get the ball back up top and, and, and dunk it. Take me through that sequence, and especially Hunter's defense in the first half. What did you see from him on that side of the ball? Yeah, that, that just is one of the things that Hunter does. Um, he's definitely one of our best defenders, and you know to do something like that just brought energy to – our whole team, especially in an environment like that where everyone's yelling at us, uh, you can't really hear none. Uh, that kind of silenced the crowd and got me just a wide open dunk. So, um, yeah, plays like that is just it just brings the most energy, and that's that's what we need from him and from everyone really. All right, moving on to the second half of the game, a little bit different. The Gales uh, start to close the gap uh, down the stretch, uh, led by Aiden Mahaney. I believe he had uh, 13 points in the final 625 of regulation and, and really, really just made some incredible shots. And you guys used a, a handful of different defenders on him. Nolan was guarding him in the first half. Hunter had his time on him in the first half. You played him in the second half. Um, what changed late in that game that allowed him to get going? Uh, I just think he <laughs> he just had all the confidence after making a couple buckets, and he wasn't passing the ball after that. After he made some tough twos, uh, he he definitely had his mindset that he was getting to the cup, and he's a tough, tough player. Like for a freshman, that's tough to do. He got some big, big, you know. <laughs> but, you know what's right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was tough. Uh, I tried to get a stop. Uh, he made a layup, and then we really didn't know what to do in the middle of the key, and he just kept isolating. So uh, credit to him, but. Uh, yeah, we got some cleaning up to do for sure on that on that side of the end. Is there anything you can do when he's making some of those just insane kind of scoop shots off the glass? And I, I think you, you played him on a few of those possessions about as well as you could have without fouling him, yeah. barreling into him. Um, he just made some some great rainbow shots and a lot of shots that uh, you know might not go in on other nights. He, he had a pretty crazy bank shot three that, yeah. that really uh, helped them. Um, just, just tell me about kind of the shots he was making. And do you feel like you could have done anything better? Or is it just a case of, you know, hats off to him for making those shots? Probably could have done a little bit better, maybe be more physical with them and attacking them on the offensive end for sure because he had four fouls. Um, but once he gets like that, once he gets hot like that, it's there's not much you can do. When he starts baking in threes, it's like, it's just tough. <laughs> Especially in overtime, it's like, it's a long game and you see a bank three going in and you're like, damn. Like you can't not really our do night, much. Right? Yeah, you can really can't do much about that. Yeah, but I do want to ask about uh, Drew Timmy um, in that game. I know, I know you guys you guys don't like to talk about personal records after a win, let alone a loss. Yeah. Um, it, it's all about the team. But Drew did move up to uh, number two on the all-time scoring list, past Jim McPhee, and he also managed to tie the uh, the school career record for field goals in a career uh, with uh, his 800th field goal. 
uh, tying Frank Burgess. Um, Frank Burgess obviously has the all-time scoring record that Drew is still going after, and I think on pace to uh, to break as long as he kind of continues this, uh, this this streak that is going on. Um, just tell me a little bit about what it's like to see uh, someone you came to Gonzaga with uh, just climb up the history books, and, and he's, he's number two right now in, uh, in all-time points. Uh, it's really, it's honestly crazy just to see like him just achieve all these records and like he just playing the game really like he's not even trying to do that he's not even trying to achieve the records he's just playing so um I'm super proud of him um being his teammate from freshman year like I've seen the growth and seen how much work he's put in so you know it's all deserved for him and it's that's not an easy thing to do for sure like those records are seem untouchable but uh, he's going to be the leading scorer of all time you you basketball, so you know I'm proud of him. There's been a lot of great scores to come through Gonzaga, so yeah. to to make it at, uh, at the top of that list, you know you have to have some longevity and and, and consistency, and he's had both things. Um, do you guys ever talk about those those records, or is it kind of like talking about a no hitter in baseball where you don't want to talk about it, <laughs> and then maybe afterward you can reflect on it? Uh, yeah, I, we don't talk about it too much. He does he doesn't really bring it up, so it's like, yeah, he kind of just doesn't really pay attention to that, but. Everyone sees it, everyone notices it, and, you know, he should be proud of that, um, to hold something like that, a record like that. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like I mentioned, you guys are 19-5 and five overall and 8-2 and two in conference play. Uh, dropped to 16 in the AP poll today. Um, I know a five-loss Gonzaga team is, is kind of not what you guys are used to. A lot of fans are a little uh, startled, and I, I know there's some overreacting that happens when the Zags lose more than one or two games in a season. But you know, there's uh, 16 teams in the top 25 that have lost at least five games. Yeah. Decent chance one of those teams makes a run and, and wins the national title. So, uh, what, what, what's kind of your perspective right now about where you guys sit? You guys aren't used to having five losses, but it's also kind of a year in college basketball where it feels like any team can lose. You guys have have beat the number three team in the country. And, and and played some close games with with teams like Baylor and, and and beat Xavier, who's number thirteen right now. How do you feel about where you guys are, generally speaking? Uh, I think I think I, we feel pretty good as a team as a whole. I feel good about us. Um, those losses are definitely tough, um, especially the close ones by like two, where you feel like you can win the game, and then something goes wrong and we lose. So those ones definitely hurt, but. Um, overall, I think we just continue to keep getting better. Like our ceiling is so high that we just need to focus on ourselves and not listen to anybody else, not listen to outside noise. Uh, just keep focusing, keep working, practice, just keep getting better. And I think we'll be fine. Like people don't understand that. Like we don't, we don't really care what people think right now. It's about the end of the season, what, where we finish. So uh, I, th- I think we'll be all right. Right. Uh, just looking ahead real quick, you guys have two more games coming up this week. WCC play is starting to kind of wind down here. Uh, San Francisco on Thursday, BYU on Saturday. Um, these are two teams that uh, probably felt like they should have beat you guys down at their place. San Francisco, Razier Bolton gets really hot late, has a has a nice little put back there at the end to, to win that game. BYU, um, everyone talks about Julian Strother's three-pointer to win the game, but you also made a key uh, defensive stand on the other side of the uh, court to, to kind of clinch that game. Um, what do you guys expect from, from the Dons and the Cougars? And I imagine it's going to be similar to when you guys play LMU for the second time, play St. Mary's for the second time. You're going to be hungry to beat those teams, and I imagine it's going to be the same for USF and BYU this week. Yeah. Well, every every team in WCC wants to beat us, especially on their home court. So I think they're going to come out fighting. Uh, San Fran's a good team, obviously. Uh, they gave us a fight. They just gave St. Mary's a fight. Like, they're, they're a good team, so we got to take them seriously. Um, I think we'll be prepared for that. And then who we play on Saturday? Uh, BYU on BYU, Saturday. BYU, yeah. They're also a good team. Like, um, especially, That's just a rivalry. Every time we play them, it's a hard game, no matter who's ranked, whatever, who they have. like They're going to play their hearts out to beat us. So we got to lock in for both those games this week because these are two big games coming up for sure. And that'll be the last game against uh, BYU, at least in the kennel as a conference rival. You guys could play them in the in the conference tournament. Is there is there maybe some more meaning to that game, knowing that it's going to be the uh, the last uh, potentially your last game against them, and potentially Gonzaga's last game as a as a conference opponent? Yeah, probably a little bit. Um, I didn't really maybe think not about that. You guys think about yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't team. really think about that too much, but yeah. Um, anytime I play BYU, that I, I know I got to put my hard hat on, and it's going to be a battle every time. So. Um, my approach really don't change. It's 
we know what they're going to bring every single time we play them. All right. Well, that does it for our uh, our first segment here. Uh, wrapped up uh, Gonzaga's last two games, previewed the next couple games, looked, uh, looked back at Gonzaga's season. Uh, after the break, we're going to get to know Anton a little bit more. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Take 22 podcast with Anton Watson, brought to you by the Spokesman Review. Uh, we talked a little bit about Gonzaga's recent games, their upcoming games. Um, right now we're going to get to know Anton a little bit more. Uh, I think in the future we're going to have some guests on during this segment, get to know some of Anton's teammates, friends, maybe some family members coming on the podcast here in the next uh, couple of weeks. So look forward to that. Anton actually grew up in, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. People, uh, people probably don't know that quite as much. I, I, th- I think everyone kind of associates you with Spokane now, but you grew up in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, your mom's side of the family is actually from Mullen, Idaho. Um, I've been to Mullen, Idaho, but uh, <laughs> do you want to explain what Mullen's like for, for some people who have never been there? Man, Mullen is it's definitely different. Uh, not that many people live there, but it's a special place for our family. Like Anytime we go up there, it's, it's super fun. It's kind of peaceful. Um, we usually we used to go there for holidays. My grandma used to live there, so let's go there every Christmas, Thanksgiving. Um, but it's definitely a special place, and if you've never been to Mullen. You should definitely, you know, drive through there. Maybe go on the Lookout Pass, something like that. But it's I, I like Mullen. It's cool. Yeah, it's really pretty country up there. Yeah. It's uh, it's a mining town, and I, I think you probably get a little bit of your toughness from from the Mullen side of the family, oh, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, the Hague Blooms. That's that's <laughs> my mom's side of the family. And she got four brothers and th- four sisters. So, yeah, they, they definitely taught me a little something about being tough. Yeah, shout out to the Hague Blooms. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we did a story on you a couple of years ago. I think it was during the uh, during the Final Four in Indianapolis. And uh, I, I believe you have some, some older fans over there. You signed some basketballs for some older women who kind of still follow you. Yeah. What's it like to just kind of know you have that support and – you have your obviously your fans at, at you know Gonzaga Prep in Spokane, but you also have this whole other section of fans in, in Idaho. Oh yeah, it's awesome. Um, anywhere I go, they really pop up and they're like, "Oh, I'm from Mullen." I'm like, "Oh, what?" Like, there's not that many people from Mullen, so it, it's cool to see people from out there, and uh, they probably know all my family out there because it's so small. And uh, it's anytime I go up there, it's a good time, and you know, it's it's fun. We're going to get a little bit into your, your roots with basketball. Uh, what's your, your first recollection of picking up a basketball? And, and just for background, uh, your, your father, Dion, uh, Dion Sr., played basketball at, uh, at the University of Idaho. I'm a Vandal alum, so I have to put the V in front there. Uh, was, was a great player there and, and made it to the NCAA tournament with the Vandal. So you have some, some basketball in your family. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your first experience playing basketball and, and uh, when you kind of got hooked on the game. Yeah, I would say my first experience was probably, like, since I was born, really. <laughs> they put a basketball on my hand. I had a little Fisher-Price hoop. You know, I was on that every day. And I had the mini hoop growing up, and then that, it eventually evolved to the to the big hoop outside in our front yard. And, you know, I had a big brother, big sister, and I used to always play against them. And then they played AAU. And I would just be at their practices, at their games, just on the side hoop, giving my shots up. So basketball has definitely been one of the biggest things in my life, and it's never really gone away. Like, I've always had a basketball around or in my hand. Tell me about the uh, the, the, the household games with, with your brother, Dion, your, your sister, Haley. What did that look like when, when you guys were kind of scrapping the driveway together? Uh, it, it definitely gets competitive. A um, couple fights sometimes, you know, tuck smack talk definitely um my sister she kind she 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 likes basketball but you know she was more a volleyball player growing up but me and my brother we'd go at it a lot and he kind of just bully me really beat me every single time until I got to the age where it was like he can't really do that anymore <laughs> but my sister too she could hoop and she did that until I got to like middle school and I was like nah I'm not losing no more <laughs> what age was that when you finally uh when you finally got your brother in a basketball game one-on-one game <sighs> I don't know maybe like freshman year of high school or eighth grade because he he's actually a good hooper like people don't realize that like he could have played basketball at, in college somewhere but he decided to go the football route but he's actually a hooper so it took him a while for him to let me win a game 
were you guys competitive in, in pretty much everything you did, whether it was sports or board yeah. games or any, anything you guys liked to do as, as kids that, that got pretty heated aside from basketball? Yeah, video games, anything really, like chores. I'm like, I'm better than you at this. You got competitive <laughs> with chores. <laughs> yeah. So, like, it was really, yeah, me and him just be going at it. Um, but also at the same time, I looked up to him, like, as a role model. Like, I wanted to be like him, so – that probably annoyed him a lot. Like, I was always by his side, like, doing everything he did. So he probably, yeah, that's probably caused a lot of competitiveness through that, too. Right. What were the chores in the in the, in the Watson household growing up? And uh, was it was it just who, who can sweep the floor fastest? Is that how you guys got competitive with chores or who's washing the dishes better? Yeah, or I honestly didn't mind doing some chores, like outside chores, you know. I'd be like, I'm going to get this done before you, something like that. But we also shared the same room, so uh, you know how that goes. If you have an older brother and you share the same room, it's kind of tough. <laughs> it's like, I want I want the room right now. It's like, nah. And, you know, I'll be on the mini hoop, on the video game, yelling or something. It's just, yeah. You also played baseball. Uh, mm-hmm. You were on a 13U team in Coeur d'Alene that uh, nearly made it to the, the college, uh, or the Little League World Series. You did make it to the uh, the California Regional. Tell me about uh, Anton Watson, the baseball player. Yeah, I was, man, I wasn't bad. I ain't gonna lie. Uh, I was a pitcher. I played first base. And then, I was gonna guess at your height, yeah. pitcher and first base were the, the only two positions that are kind of natural, right? But I could play like wherever. I played shortstop a little bit, third base, center field, and then I was the four hitter. I was a cleanup. So anytime I got to the play, it was either a home run, double, or a pop out, really. Maybe a triple every <laughs> yeah, now and then. Yeah, maybe a triple every now and then. Yeah. But, yeah, the baseball days were super fun. Like, those those hold a lot of memories and still like a lot of those dudes growing up with. Um, I spend a lot of time with them. If you know baseball, you practice, like, four hours, and a lot of it's not even running or anything or working out. It's kind of just standing there and spitting out seeds, so... The relationships I built through baseball were super cool, and you know, I was glad I got the experience of that. Best flavor of uh, sunflower seed? Just the original, or we're we, we going to go with I like cracked lime? pepper. Cracked pepper? Yeah. yeah dill pickle, choice. not bad, too, but right. cracked pepper is my favorite. Tell me tell me about your your uh, your pitching style, go-to pitches, how hard could you throw it? What were the batters looking at? I think I threw about 70 miles per hour. I had the two seam. That was probably my best pitch, and then the four seam, and then I had a little change up. And then I had a I had one curveball, but I, I only brought that out a couple times. Uh, a couple times a game. Yeah, I didn't want to mess up my shoulder, but yeah. the curveball was nasty too. What was that ride like with that with that thirteen U team, and uh, how close were you guys to actually getting to Williamsport there? Uh, I think, yeah, it was it was crazy. Um, it was nothing I really experienced with sports. Um, we stayed in San Bernardino, and if you've seen like the complex. It's like, kind of like, I don't even know how to describe it, but we were rooming with the Hawaiians, and I've never really met that many Hawaiians at once, and it was probably the coolest experience I've had just with any type of sport, just hanging with them um, off the field and just seeing them play and stuff and just meeting new friends. But, yeah, that was one of the craziest experiences. And then I think... We played, like, Montana, and we lost on, like, a walk-off. But we would have played Washington, who I think they went to Williamsport. And they had a good squad. Like, they are super good. But, yeah, I think we lost to Montana on a walk-off. That's which, tough, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, then, and then kind of shifting to, uh, to basketball growing up, you uh, eventually kind of moved to Spokane, started mm-hmm. playing sports in Spokane, played on an AAU team coached by uh, – Point guard, some people might know. Uh, John Stockton <laughs> yeah. played on John Stockton's team. Tell me about that experience. How you end up on an AAU team with John Stockton, and, and what was that like learning from, uh, you know, one of the best to do it? Oh uh, yeah, so I I grew up playing with my like Coeur d'Alene friends. Um, my mom and dad were the coach for a long time. Then I kind of started to shift over to Spokane area and started playing with some of the club teams over there around like eighth grade. And then after my eighth grade season. I was, it was a good season. Like, I was dunking and stuff. Like, I got a couple of my first dunks. And Tell me about your first dunk. I know every player remembers that first dunk, so. <laughs> I think my first dunk was in seventh grade, and it was like a middle school game. So the team we played was just terrible. But 
all, all my teammates were like, you got to dunk it this game. I was like, all right, like, I'm going to get one this game. And everyone in the whole gym was just shocked. They're like, especially from Idaho, like, no one's ever seen that in Idaho. So, yeah, that was definitely a cool experience, just being able to dunk it at that age. And not many people seen that, so it was cool. Did you learn any uh, any ball skills from from John Stockton? I, you're you're kind of known for being a, a big man who can handle it along with Drew, but playing under a guard like that, do you, do you kind of learn how to become a guard even though you're a big man? Yeah, no no question. Um, he didn't really the way we practice. He didn't really care what position you played. I think we all did the same thing, like drills, all the same drills, ball handling drills, passing drills. It didn't really matter. Like if you were big, you got to do the same drills as the point guard. So that definitely helped me a lot. And then just as IQ of the game, like, it's it's crazy. Like, just to sit in a room and listen to him talk about basketball, you would be amazed at just all the things that he thinks of while he's playing. So I definitely picked up so much from him, and it's helped me till this day with the game of basketball. I'm sure a handful of the listeners kind of followed you at Gonzaga Prep, but I want to hear especially about your uh, your 2017 I believe it was the 2017-18 season, your junior year. You guys go 27 and 0, win the state title. I'm just going to read you some of the some of the guys that were on that team. You know them, but for the listeners, Liam Lloyd, yeah. playing at Northern Arizona, uh, originally played at Grand Canyon. Yourself, Carter Sonneborn, who played at Washington State mm-hmm. as a walk-on, went to Whitworth after that. AJ Few, uh, Devin Culp, UW yeah. football player, Sam Lockett, WCU football player. Yeah. Has to be the most athletic team in in eastern washington in history right yeah yeah we had some dogs on that team and uh, if you watch us play like we played with that energy like defense we weren't letting people score on us at all and we were dunking everyone could dunk it was just like we were just kind of just smacking teams really and the most physical team i've probably played on growing up for Looking sure. at some of these scores, 71-35, 71-26. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're, so you're definitely doing it on both sides of the floor. <laughs> yeah. any, any memories of that season that stuck out to you? Uh, I'm sure the state title is, is one of them, yeah. probably at the top of the list. Um, that, was, that was the year we played Richland, um, and that was probably one of my best games in of my high school career. I mean, I dunked it twice on the big fella. and then Riley Soren. I, yeah, then I up. hit the game winner, so that was probably like yeah. – one of the best games I played ever and you know that team was just it was really a brotherhood like everyone loved being around each other and we kicked it on and off the court like every day so um you know that team was definitely special we're going to talk a little bit about your uh, decision to go to Gonzaga but first I want to know when did you start kind of following Gonzaga's basketball program growing up um any any uh, specific games that you remember being kind of the first game or first few games that you watched uh not too. I I watched them a lot growing up, and then I think one of the first times I really started like locking in on Gonzaga it was probably when I was like third grade. Um, Austin Day he pulled up to one of our like park and rec games, and I was like I really didn't know who he was. Like I was just a youngin. I I used to be like fans of anyone. Like I was low key a bandwagon when I was a younger, but. Um, yeah, he pulled up to the game, and he was like 6'10". I was like, who is this? Everyone's going crazy. So um, I, I got to meet him and got his autograph, and I was like, yeah, this is this is pretty cool, like just to see someone local, someone close, and he's just out here supporting. So, you know, that's the first time I really started, you know, liking the Zags like that. Would you say he was kind of your Gonzaga idol growing up, if you had a favorite player maybe, or was there someone else that kind of became the guy that you looked up to? Uh, Yeah, I'll say he's one of them. And then, obviously, Morrison, he he was that guy when he played. So I definitely was like, yeah, he was tough. And then Gary Bell, I don't think he gets enough love. Um, when I watched him play, he, kinda, he played against my brother, I think, in high school because they were around the same age. My brother was playing club, and my brother said, like, he was one of the toughest players he's ever seen. So, um, GB, yeah, he was super tough, and he knows that, too. He's still tough. He'd be playing pickup with us. Like, he's still getting buckets. Um, and, and then just moving on to Gonzaga, when did you know that Gonzaga is the school I want to go to? You committed pretty early. 
uh, you know, hopefully we can have Coach Few on the podcast to talk about recruiting you, but it had to be the shortest recruiting trip. Yeah. You guys have recruited everywhere in the world, <laughs> Japan, Australia, all over yeah. Europe. Um, driving a mile down the road to G Prep probably isn't too bad. No, nah, it, yeah, it was, it was a pretty easy decision. Um, I think I committed my sophomore year, but yeah, I think it was a good decision for me to make that early. Um, I got to hang out with the dudes, uh, worked out with Rui a couple times, uh, got to see just the process. I was so close, I got to go to most of the games, um, and just seeing that environment was, was super cool. Like, it was, it was special, I could tell, and then just the family atmosphere that they hold is it's different from any other college, and I think a lot of people can say that. Yeah. Um, we, we talked about your basketball career. We talked about your, your baseball career. Um, I have a, a Twitter submission from a family member who was telling me to ask about your time running cross country in elementary school. Ah, do you have any recollection of running cross man, country? I do. And placing first. Who was that? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an anonymous source. Uh, yeah, you can ask later. It, yeah, it might have been my mom. But, yeah, cross country, I did that a lot. Uh, first grade, second grade. I think I won districts. But, yeah, I was a running machine. <laughs> like, like, I'll wake up early in the morning, just go run. And, you know, it kind of faded away. It wasn't my favorite thing, but when I was competitive. So, like, any type of sport, like, I was trying to win at it. And cross country, yeah, I was I was pretty good at it. Um, I'm sure there's got to be some carryover between running cross country and playing basketball. You're running up and down a court for yeah. two hours. So I'm sure, I'm sure that helped a little bit, even though it was a long time ago. So. Yeah, I, I think it helped in the long run for sure. Yeah. All right, that's going to do it for this segment. We're going to move on to our uh, catch-and-shoot segment. Uh, a couple quick hitter questions with Anton before we get out of here. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Take 22 podcast with Anton Watson. This is our last segment. We're going to do this every episode. It's called uh, Catch and Shoot, so a couple of quick hitter questions. Um, this is uh, going to be themed every week, so this week we're going to say, uh, you know, if you had to do one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? So I have, I have a few questions here for Anton. Uh, so we're going to start out. If you had to wear one basketball shoe for the rest of your life in games, what would it be and why? i will probably say the Kobe 8s. Um, I had one pair of those and, like, they're probably my favorite shoe, like, most comfy. And I like the low cuts. So, yeah, those, those are my favorite shoes. It kind of sucks because they're so hard to get, but... Yeah, the, they're super nice. What's the colorway? I had the red and black ones. I think yeah. the whole team got the red and black ones, but I wore those, like, every single game, every practice. Like, I wish I could get another pair right now. If you had to listen to one musical artist for the rest of your life, <sighs> only, only get one. That's tough. I'll say Drake. Drake. Okay. Can't go wrong with Drake. Yeah, can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, one pregame song. And I'm sure you have a list of pregame songs that you listen to before every game, but... If you have to listen to one on a repeat for an hour before every game, mm. what's it going to be? Man, I don't know. That's a tough one. I listen to so many different songs, like, before a game. Right now, though, if I had to choose, it would be Just Wanna Rock by Lil Uzi. That's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think Everyone's they played that, that before the same game, too. I know that. Too, so. Yeah, that's my song. Uh, one dinner course you have to eat every day for the rest of your life. Pasta. It, it don't really matter what kind of pasta. I'll say just... Any kind of white sauce, red sauce, like that's my favorite thing to eat. Anything on it, cheese, any kind of meat. Maybe some parmesan, spices, yeah, parmesan. Some, some meat in there. Can't go wrong with that, right? Yeah. One breakfast item. Breakfast item. Bagel, actually. When I was growing up, I used to eat bagel like every single day before school with some cream cheese or just butter. Yeah. But like that's my favorite breakfast item. Just a plain bagel, yeah. cinnamon raisin, just plain. Maybe some okay. a cheesy bagel. And the last one, uh, I know you're a big FIFA guy. I'm yeah. a FIFA guy myself. I'm a soccer yeah, guy. Uh, you have to pick one FIFA team to play with for the rest of your life, and you can't you can't choose PSG because I think that's ah, cheating yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. No, nah, it's it's Real Madrid. Real Madrid. Madrid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's my squad. You know, I really just started watching soccer about three years ago, but um, yeah, that's my squad. That's a good choice. You can't go <laughs> yeah. wrong with Real Madrid. Yeah, they're tough. Them, Barcelona, there's probably a number of teams you could choose there. Yeah. But, but. All right, that's going to do it for our catch and shoot segment. Uh, this is a first episode of Take 22 with Anton Watson. Uh, we're going to be doing this for the rest of the season. Uh, I think we'll have one postseason show too, so stay tuned every, uh, every Tuesday for the rest of the year. 
And that's it. Thanks, Anton. Yes, sir. It's a wrap.